It's 10 a.m. here in Central Europe, and I think we're ready to start. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sudeshna Borosaikia. I'm a postdoc here at the University of Vienna, and I'm a member of the IAU Executive Committee Working Group junior members. So, uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, IAU ECA uh, online, online discourse event number eight. So, uh, my name is Gael Belgen. I'm a postdoc at the University of Geneva, and uh, I'm also a member of the executive committee of the junior member working group. So um, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Philippa Hartley. Uh, she'll speak about preparing for a new era in astronomy. Uh, she's an astrophysicist who specialized in gravitational lensing, active galactic nuclei, radio interferometry, and data processing. She has obtained a PhD at the University of Manchester in 2019. Uh, she worked on detecting and studying strong gravitational lenses to better understand quasars. And she's now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Manchester working on uh, SKA, uh, the Square Kilometer Array. And uh, she's coordinating the uh, SKA Science Data Challenges. She's an active member of a lot of SKA working groups and uh, of the International Space Science Institute of the Euclid Consortium, as well as the LSST Corporation. Uh, she has applied to a lot of uh, successful observation proposal over the last three years, and she was awarded uh, the SKA Exceptional Performance Award in 2021. So, uh, Philippa, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us here. So the talk will be 30 minutes, and then we'll have a 30-minute uh, discussion. Um, so if you want to post the questions, you, you have a Q&A option, and you can actually do, do this on Zoom, and there is also a chat option. On, uh, on YouTube. If you run out of time, we'll try to answer your, your questions. In any case, we'll take note of them and we'll, uh, we'll answer them in writing. So thank you very much. And Philippa, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. And just to check, everyone can see that. Yeah, awesome. OK. Well, thank you so much for having me today um, and inviting me to speak. I think this series is really exciting um, to be discussing not just work, but also um, the variety of career paths that we, we are taking um, to do what we love, which is astronomy. Um, so today I will be talking to you about um, my work at the SKA and how I'm helping the community prepare for a new era in astronomy. But I'll also be talking a little bit as well about how I have been preparing for my career in astronomy. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on different steps in my career, um, which has been a, a slightly unusual um, journey, maybe compared to some. Um, but yeah, once again, thanks so much to the organizers um, for your support and for inviting me today. So um, in terms of career path, um, my journey began quite a long time ago now, scarily long time ago, um, back at the turn of the century, um, where I graduated from a physics degree at Liverpool. Um, so I'll probably come back to this theme, but I've always just had a pull towards physics whenever, you know, since a, a child, it is quite cheesy. You know, I just absolutely fascinated by it. Um, I think as a girl growing up in the 1990s, it was it wasn't the usual thing to do. Um, I was the only girl in my A level class, um, but it, it was that pull was always there, which overcame any perhaps societal pressures to to do other things. Um, but after I graduated, um, I became a mum to these lovely young people on the left. Um, and I spent quite a few years as a stay at home mum, um, which was, I was extremely lucky to be able to do. Um, and it was a wonderful time. A lot of the time was spent um, taking my sons to, you might recognize Jodrell Bank in the background. Um, this was driven by me. <laughs> um, any excuse to get out there and see the big telescope um, and to be connected with that world again. Um, so much so that I think the two, my two boys got a little bit sick of it. Um, so they were probably very glad um, 
when I decided to actually go and study astrophysics at a later stage and not put them through many, many more visits to Jodrell Bank. Um, when they did go finally go to school, I really wanted to continue with my career. And at that stage, I was really interested in photography. Um, I'd done an A-level in photography um, and I was part of a collective of artists who um, exhibited our work. Um, I even considered going and doing a fine art photography degree. Um, so I just wanted to highlight this because I think we often perhaps sort of pigeonhole ourselves um, as, you know, in, in the UK at least, my experience is that you're labelled as an, a scientist or an artist, but actually we're all capable of all of this stuff. And, and in fact, art and science, I think, can go really well together. Um, so I nearly enrolled for a photography degree, but um, and I went along with my friend on the top right there, um, the lovely Jane, um, to a degree open day. But it was at that open day that I looked across and saw um, a stand for science and engineering. And it was at that moment that I knew I just had to go back to the science. Um, it was calling me back again. So I instead enrolled on um, my postgraduate studies at the University of Manchester. Um, so beginning with my master's degree and then my PhD, um, both of these I was able to complete part-time on a part-time basis, which was incredibly important for me. It meant I was able to work around the school holidays and to work around school hours for my sons, which I was in incredibly lucky to be able to do. Um, and the department was incredibly supportive of this. Um, you know, I never felt that I was treated differently for doing the degrees part time. So this is a really important part of my career steps. Um, and it was really wonderful as well to be able to take my sons along to my graduation days when they happened. And also, um, very fortunate to have the support of my lovely husband, Peter, um, who has sat and listened to every talk I've given as I practice it and read through probably everything I've written for typos. So um, a heroic, heroic support from him. Um, oh, I've just, there we go. Yeah. Um, so after my PhD, that's when I landed at the SKA, uh, first of all, in quite a technical role. So I would say this is the part of my career that exposed me most to um, the kind of working you would have in industry. Um, I was embedded in a SKA software team, which I'll describe in a bit. And um, finally, I started my position as an SKA postdoctoral fellow. So I'll talk a little bit about the work. I'm doing that. Um, I think there's, there might be quite a lot that I'll cover, so I'll try and skip through it with, with quite an overview. Um, so at Manchester, um, I began my studies part-time looking at, first of all, well, looking at the phenomenon of gravitational lensing. So for my master's, I was looking at the weak effect of this um where you can where you can't see any distortion from the gravitational lensing in an individual source but if you map many 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 background sources like galaxies what you start to see is a signature of large scale structure between you and the background galaxies which you can measure if you average over their shapes um, so i was doing some modeling um, some simulations to see how well we might be able to recover that signature. And that modeling experience um, which you came in very handy later on um, in my work at the SKA. Um, during my PhD, I looked at the strong gravitational effect. So this is where you have two sources that are aligned very precisely along our line of sight such that the light from the background source is distorted as it passes the gravitational field 
towards us of the intervening source. And this creates huge, well, this, this can create a very large magnification effect. So we can use strong lenses to look at background sources in greater detail, but we can also use them to probe the mass structure of the intervening galaxy. So there's all kinds of exciting um, science we can do with strong lensing. And I think they are, I think strong lenses are awesome. Um, yeah, once again, I want to credit my supervisors with all their support for studying part-time and support in general. It was a really, really great experience, both of the degrees. Um, so when I joined Manchester, this was my first um, journey into radio astronomy. And I just wanted to touch on how cool radio astronomy is um, and why I love it. Um, so unlike in the visible spectrum in radio, you get to see all these processes that are otherwise invisible. And the processes that we do see are often the result not of say thermal effects, but usually the result of really violent gravitational effects like um, the jets that you get out of supermassive black holes or supernova explosions. And of course you can also see, um, you can also use radio to map out tidal effects of galaxies interacting. So I just think it's so cool how we get access to this in otherwise invisible part of the universe using radio astronomy. Um, and of course, because radio light has such a long wavelength, um, when we think about how wavelength, wavelength determines the resolution of our instruments, we realize that we can make huge radio telescopes, but even the very biggest ones have a limit of how finely resolved our images are going to be. Um, so to get around this in radio astronomy, we combine signals from lots of different telescopes um, known as radio interferometry. And again, I, I just love, I love this. I just think it's such an amazing technique and it's been such a privilege to be able to use um, these different instruments over, over the years and to reduce data from them. Um, so when you think that you're combining, when, when you're making images, you're combining data from telescopes all over the world is pretty cool. Um, and you're using them to look so far into space as well. Um, that, that really, it just is so exciting. Um, and even more exciting given that we're about to start a new era where we're going to be able to do this. Um, we're going to look far, far deeper into space with all the new telescopes going up, including the SKA. Um, so just touching on some of my science highlights, if I may. Um, this is one of my favourite ones. So um, this is using a strong gravitational lens to study a radio quiet quasar. Um, so radio quiet quasars are pretty intriguing. Um, so we're all familiar with radio loud quasars, which are the ones that have those massive um, radio jets that you saw a few images ago. Um, you can see those in radio observations. They look amazing. Um, you can see that there's some kind of massive engine in the center of the galaxy that's spewing out all this plasma. However, the radio loud quasars only make up about 10% of the, the quasar population. The rest of them are radio quiet. So these radio quiet sources don't have very much radio signal. And for a while it was thought that they didn't have any radio emission at all, but they do. They have very faint radio emission. Now, strong lensing comes in handy here because we can use that magnification effect of lensing as cosmic telescopes in order to magnify this very faint radio quiet quasar emission and begin to get a better handle on what exactly is causing the emission. So this is what we did with this particular source where you can see um, there would be an invisible lensing galaxy 
in the image plane on the left and it's invisible because we're looking in radio light and the radio there, there doesn't happen to be any radio light from the lens in galaxy the blobs you can see around that are all images of the background source which is the quasar um, strong lenses tend to split the background source into multiple images so what you then have to do is do some fancy modeling to map the resulting images back to the source plane. And that's what we did, resulting in the image on the right. So this is looking at back in uh, to the redshift of the actual lensed source, so the radio quiet quasar, where we found that the, the, the radio images that we see map back into two really compact sub-parsec scale sources, really faint as well, um, intrinsically sub Milijansky, um, but with very high brightness temperature. And they have this really cool linear alignment either side of the optical core, which was modeled um, along with all the radio data used um, from Hubble data as well. Um, so allowing us to confirm that in this source, uh, the source of the radio emission is some mini radio jets. Um, this is as opposed to another possibility, which would be that the emission comes from star formation activity. So this, trying to answer this question will tell us a lot about the evolution of galaxies. Um, if it turns out that radio quiet quasars can sustain star formation, um, that would give us a slightly different picture to if, it, if they can't. Um, so what's thought to happen is that different modes of um, AGN feedback, so quasars feeding back through um, winds blasting through the galaxy or through the jets, they're thought, all that kind of feedback's thought to suppress star formation. So it's really important to find out what's going on in this population of radio quiet quasars. And next one. Um, another highlight from my postgraduate studies was the involvement in the Euclid mission. Um, so I'm still involved in the Strong Lensing Science Working Group. And we have a white paper coming out soon, which will describe all the cool science we can do from uh, data from the Euclid mission. Um, so Euclid will be imaging around 10 billion sources. And we expect to find around 300,000 strong lenses within um, the sources that Euclid observes. Um, with this huge amount of lenses, we can start doing some cool statistical techniques um, to look at things like how the mass, how the dark matter mass of galaxies has evolved over time um, and the substructure of galaxies, substructure of dark matter. Um, and we can obviously use them all as cosmic lens, uh, cosmic telescopes as well. But uh, before we do all that, we need to find the sources among the billions in the images. Um, so to that end, there's a lot of work that's been going on um, in the Euclid groups, but also in the LSST um, and obviously in all, in all the big um, survey groups, the SKA working groups as well to develop automated methods of finding sources in big data. Um, so I was part of an effort to develop a novel machine learning technique to do this. Um, and one of the highlights of um, this effort was um, winning a prize in the Strong Lens Finding Challenge um, a few years ago. Um, so the prize was revealed in Bern um, at the ISSI and it was actually, you can't really see it there, but it was a chocolate, one of those chocolate Nobel prizes, which I haven't eaten and I still have. Um, that's obviously a placeholder for when I get the real Nobel prize. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not going to get eaten. Um, and I used this um, automated strong lens finding technique to find some real strong lenses in real data from the kilo degree survey. So this was really exciting to actually um, be able to find some real, you can see here that we have 
um, sort of multiply imaged background sources and curves and um, arc, arc shapes as well. Um, these, lend, these candidate sources will be um, looked at in follow-up studies as well, just to confirm they are actually strong lenses. Some of them, it's, there's no doubt. Some of them could be contaminating sources such as polar rings polar ring galaxies. Um, another application of machine learning that I've been looking into um, is the use of machine learning to do radio or interferometric data modeling. Um, so when you're doing interferometry, what you're really doing is you're taking um, a Fourier transform of the sky that your telescopes has collected and you need to Fourier transform it back. Now, that means you've got a load of amplitudes and phases, but what happens when the signal's coming through the sky to the telescopes? Those phases get corrupted by the atmosphere, so they get all scrambled, and you need to do a lot of unscrambling them um, in cali calibration procedures. Um, so this is fine, and we can normally do this quite well if we have nearby calibrator sources, near our target sources, but sometimes we don't have reliable calibrator sources. And one way of getting around that problem is to go back to the technique that was used at the beginning of radio interferometry, which is to use these closure phases, so a technique called closure phase mapping. And this uses the fact that when you combine phases from um, different telescopes, if you combine them into what we call closure phase triangles, any errors, any phase errors that have been introduced by the atmosphere, they get cancelled out. So a closure phase triangle is actually a representation of the real sky without your errors. So if you can use those closure phase triangles, if you can map them into image space, then you get an image that's free, supposedly free from errors. This normally takes an awful lot of computational time and expense, um, but people are beginning to look at it again and work out ways of using that. Um, it was used in the um, EHT um, observations to look at um, the, black, the amazing black hole image we saw a couple of years ago. Um, but I started with Neil Jackson, um, I started investigating the use of machine learning to map between closure phase images um, in time and frequency space to the source plane. Um, so it's basically an image translation exercise. And two of my students are continuing to look into this and they've done some amazing work managing to show as a proof of concept that this looks like it can work. So we will see. Um, but this, the experiences I've outlined um, really prepared me very well for when I began my um, time at the SKA. So um, as we'll all have heard, the SKA Observatory was born this month, which is incredibly exciting. So before now we were an organisation, um, but this year we are turning into an intergovernmental organisation, so a truly international organisation. Um, and that internationality is reflected at every part of the SKA, and it's something that I find extremely exciting and enriching experience as well. The picture you can see here is our headquarters in Cheshire in the UK. Um, and I'll be touching on the headquarters in a minute. Um, but to talk about the internationality again. Um, so the SKA is um, going to be building two telescopes, um, two radio telescopes, one in Australia and one in South Africa. And of course, the headquarters is up in the UK. Um, we have member countries around the world, African partners, and many people involved in so many different ways. It's just a wonderful 
it's, it's such a privilege to be involved in something that is a truly global undertaking. Um, so just a, a little bit about the telescopes themselves. Um, SKA Low is looking at the very lowest radio frequencies. Um, it's going to be built in Australia. And this will involve arrays of lots and lots and lots of dipole antennas. So quite simple antennas like you get on your car. Um, although the engineers probably wouldn't say it's simple. It's certainly not simple to design and set up so many um, and yeah so these are these will be able to pick up the very lowest radio frequencies and many 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 dipole antennas need to be combined to make effectively one big telescope and that's not a trivial task <laughs> um, SKA mid um, the mid telescopes are dishes um, and they are they're going to be situated in South Africa and they are going to be picking up slightly higher radio frequencies. And just to, um, to illustrate why the telescopes are being built. Um, so on the right, you have an image from the VLA and the VLA, you know, it is state of the art. It's, it's a fantastic instrument um, and it's enabled me to see some really, really faint emission from really distant sources. So on the right, you have a VLA image where you've combined um, four different configurations of the VLA. So this means um, the VLA telescopes can be arranged um, with different distances between them. And if you combine all those configurations, it's like you've got an even bigger telescope. Um, so the image on the right has done just this, and it, it's got a nice image. But the image on the left is a simulation of the same source observed by a snapshot of the SKA. Um, so the, the key features of SKA images will not only be the sensitivity of the SKA, so the depth of the images, but also the very, very, very minimal effect of what we call the dirty beam. So the dirty beam is just a radio astronomy name for the PSF um, of the instrument. And it tends to be quite messy because when you're using an interferometer, it's like you're using a telescope with loads of holes in it. You end up with quite a messy um, PSF and it involves a certain amount of deconvolution to get your final image. The SKA, because it will build so many telescopes in an array, it will have a very, very minimal amount of this effect. And science, so why are we doing it? Um, there's so much cool science that the SKA will enable. I'll just run through a few, a handful of things. Um, so when we observe continuum radio emission, we'll be able to study galaxy evolution, we'll be able to do cosmology like the weak gravitational lensing um, that I mentioned earlier, we'll be able to constrain dark energy. Um, looking at very high time resolution observations, um, scientists will be able to do strong field tests of gravity using pulsars and black holes. Um, looking at polarizing polarized information, we can look at the origin of cosmic magnetism. And using spectral line observations, we can map new, neutral hydrogen going all the way back to cosmic dawn when the very first galaxies were being formed. And we can look at molecular things, so looking for the signatures of life in space. And perhaps the most exciting, um, and why we're all doing science, is the exploration of the unknown. So who knows, with this amount of observing power, um, what will turn up. Um, so back to Earth, um, on into the SKA headquarters. Um, I just wanted to mention this because it's, it, it is such a privilege to be able to work somewhere where there is such a diversity um, of ways of thinking, of colleagues, of backgrounds. And this is really celebrated at the SKA. Um, 
so for instance in our food of the world days that are held that have been held fairly regularly um at the hq until covid so i think um we're all missing these days and um i'm hungry just looking at that lovely food in those images um another extremely exciting thing about working at the SK headquarters is, and I make no apologies for all these photos, um, the Lovell telescope. So um, the, I just can't see the Lovell telescope too many times. It's such an inspiration um, to think that, I think when it was built, it was only expected to last a few years. I, can't, I don't know if that's right, but um, here it still is. Um, just standing the test of time and an amazing icon um, as you walk into work. It's truly inspiration. Okay, a bit, little bit about um, introducing the idea of the SKA data flow now. Um, so I'll be touching on some of these concepts in a short while as I talk about what I'm doing um, at the moment. Um, so the SKA will receive Will, will produce huge amounts of data. Um, it's a, a truly big data problem. Um, so data arriving at, from the telescopes um, has to be correlated. And this will happen in the central signa signal processor. Um, so we have teams finding out the very best ways, most efficient ways to reduce so much data, nine terabytes per second um, plus another five from, so that's two telescopes, nine from one, five from another, um, reducing all that down to just five terabytes per second. Um, this all goes into the science data processor, which is where all the calibration and imaging that we normally do ourselves as astronomers, um, this will all happen inside these supercomputers that are being designed to specifically that for that purpose. Um, so the idea is those images will be sent along to our SKA regional centres, um, where some more processing will happen. Perhaps the images will be combined or mosaic together. Um, and this is where the science community will be able to interact with the data. So um, the SKA regional centres or SRCs will be distributed facilities around the world. And science users will be able to choose where they access the data and will be able to inter interact with the data where it is hosted rather than downloading the data to themselves. Um, so in order to realize this model, um, a certain amount of preparation, not only within the SK, but also of the community is going to be necessary. Um, so I'll talk about my very small roles really in this um, giant effort. Um, so again, it's, it's such a privilege to be a part of building something so uh, groundbreaking. Um, and my first role as part of the SKA came as part of an STFC innovation placement. So this is a six month placement um, in one of the software teams, and it was doing radio interferometry simulations. Um, in these teams, I was working with people in the science data processor teams, um, which is are the teams who are working out how to calibrate such large amounts of data um, and design supercomputers, and also working with teams from the DISH consortium so this image just gives you an overview of the various consortia that were involved in designing the actual SKA. Design phase is finished now and amazing work that these people have done um, to get it to where we are now, which is about to begin construction. Um, so what was I doing in this placement? What we wanted to look at was um, how the various environmental errors on telescope dishes affect image fidelity. Um, so this is a picture, an artist's visualization of dishes in the Karoo Desert in South Africa. Um, 
dishes are in in such conditions are obviously subject to a lot of heat actually quite a lot of wind the trees aren't really very realistic but you, you get the idea um, and also of course you've got the effect of good old gravity pulling on your dish so we wanted to understand how these errors might affect image fidelity and so far, the results are ongoing, but so far we found that the effects are reassuringly small. Um, and I just wanted to mention as part of thinking about career paths, um, what particularly I learned from this placement, which as I say is um, pretty much compared to, compared to coming from academia, um, with my PhD, this was very much um, an industry style placement. Um, and it was a little bit of a culture shock at first. Um, so there are quite different ways of managing um, projects and managing software development, which are incredibly necessary. Um, the way that the SKA has chosen to do this is to use a safe framework so you don't need to know too much about safe if you're not in industry um, but all it means is it's using agile which is an iterative approach to project management and software development it just means that instead of when you're designing software instead of doing that very sequentially in what's called a traditional waterfall model you're instead doing it in a very iterative way. So you're continually reviewing, you're continually reviewing the development, you're continu continually interacting with your customers and your stakeholders. And this means that you can have a lot of flexibility over what you're creating. Um, you have a great amount of alignment. So there are many increments within within a month and within the years where teams have to align within themselves and teams align between each other as well. So this, this creates an awful lot of transparency and visibility of what teams are doing, which actually in the long run, I think makes things more efficient because you can see um, it minimizes the amount of re it minimizes the amount of times that things are done twice. Um, so I think I've been able to take inspiration from some of these concepts into my own work. Um, so it's been a really useful experience. I would say again, it was quite a culture shock. Um, this way of working is very different <laughs> to the way I was used to working as a PhD, um, every, you know, yeah, very different. Um, but I feel that it was very useful. And one of the things I really took from it was um, the emphasis on collaboration. So collaborations, something we're all used to doing. Um, but this really opened up the idea that collaboration, you know, looking for collaboration opportunities, um, and fostering collaboration, um, how exciting that actually is. Um, so moving on to my current position at the SKA as a postdoctoral fellow, um, I'm involved in co-coordinating the science data challenges. Um, so the challenges are important because SKA data is going to be huge. Um, it's going to be different to what scientists have used before and we want to help to prepare the community for that so we want to help science teams to be able to develop analysis methods and we want to help teams to be able to design future SKA surveys. Um, by setting these challenges we also get opportunities to um, test things like software prototyping for our SKA regional centres um, members of the science community can test our data access models. And we also want to encourage best practices for open science and reproduci reproducibility, 
which we are aiming to do with our challenges, as I will describe shortly. Um, we've run two data challenges so far. One, the first one was a radio continuum challenge um, and the findings from that have been published this year. Um, the second one is a spectral line observation challenge. Um, so for both of these, we produce simulated data and in both of the challenges, um, the description of the challenge was to do source finding and characterization. Um, I'm really lucky to work in a lovely team at the SKA and the science team, and also to be able to collaborate with people in the different teams at the SKA. So again, that theme of collaboration is, is really going through um, what I've experienced so far. And I think that is one of the most exciting things about the SKA as well. Collaboration is really encouraged and supported um yeah and it's just it's very cool to work with um people with a range of, a huge range of expertise um so the data we are producing is very large um large relatively large data sets um up to a terabyte um so what we wanted to do with our latest challenge was to make sure that everyone is able to anyone who wants to is able to participate um, so knowing it's such a large data set and being aware that um, depending on where you are, it might not be feasible to download a whole terabyte onto your own computer. We came up with the idea of hosting the data elsewhere. Um, so we got in touch with some of our partners, um, some proto SKA regional centre facilities and also a growing number of partners who are responsible for high perf performance computing facilities around the world. Um, and we were really excited to build this platform of eight um, computational facilities who are currently hosting our challenge data and on which our participants are accessing the data and processing it. Um, so this model has been really exciting to develop um, and is also going to provide us with different ways of testing the future SKA SRC models. Um, so we can test things like data transport, we can test um, different ways of accessing the data um, and we're hoping that we can provide a lot of feedback once the challenge is closed um for the operations side of things that so that they can then use the feedback as they develop their um, operational models um one of the ways we want to encourage open science and reproducibility is to award teams with these reproducibility awards so these will sit alongside our main data challenges and they are designed to just get teams thinking about um, thinking about their software pipelines and how they can write um, pipelines that produce reproducible results um, and how they can make their codes reusable by other teams. Um, so we have bronze, silver and gold levels of these awards and these awards are awarded completely independently of how well teams do in the main challenge because we just think this is super important and it will also help um, preparing for the future again of the SKA where um, teams will be interacting with our regional centres. So we have a list online, we have a um, list checklist of criteria for our awards, so please do have a look if you're interested. Um, this shows how we award either bronze, silver or gold. Um, we tried to provide um, a list of criteria that are achievable um, that encourage teams to write well-documented, easy to install and easy to use pipelines so that their results can be reproduced. And also to write codes that have an open license, um, are findable on the internet and use coding standards um, and built-in tests. And one thing I will say is this has been extremely educational for me. So 
I haven't used the checklist on my own software yet. Um, I will be doing it. I don't think I'll be getting a gold award. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but it's certainly opened my eyes to what I need to do to make sure I'm also um, following open science and reproducibility principles. Um, and we developed this um, checklist in partnership with the Software Sustainability Institute who are based across the UK, um, a partnership between different um, institutions. Um, so we're incredibly grateful to their guidance on this. And um, yeah, this, this is our current status. We're up to date now. Um, so just a couple of weeks ago, we launched our second data challenge where we had interest from nearly 300 people who registered um, over 80 institutions, 40 teams in 23 countries across the world. So we were incredibly excited to see this geographical distribution. And once again, it's just such a privilege such a privilege to be able to be involved in this. Okay, and I think this, that's nearly it from me. So um, I just wanted to recap on some of the themes so far through my journey. Um, hopefully that can be um, maybe useful to others who are um, just beginning their journeys. Um, so, themes. So what's really helped me so far is support. I have to acknowledge and thank support from so many people, from um, my supervisors, my departments, my current team, the science team at the SKA, um, and of course my family and friends. Um, so recognising how important that's been in, in my career so far. Collaboration. This is something I absolutely love. And again, it's, it's just so exciting to be able to collaborate with different people who are working on different things. And through those collaborations, coming up with something bigger than the sum of our parts. I just find that I'm always looking for those opportunities. Um, leadership opportunities. So, yeah, it's... It, I think it's really cool to start to realise that leadership opportunities are actually all around us. So we don't need to be in a position of leadership to, to show leadership, um, you know, whether it's organising a meeting, um, whether it's coming up with a proposal. Um, I think it's really, it's really useful to get into the habit of looking for those opportunities early on as early on as you as you want in your career and confidence this is a huge theme for me <laughs> um starting well coming to academia after being a stay-at-home mum was very very daunting um and you know I still yeah I, I would not have believed that I would be able to give this talk <laughs> um but you can build confidence and you know the, I think the way I found to do that is to just not be afraid of failure. So I think that's something we all struggle with, fear of failure, because, you know, because this, our careers are so important because we're so passionate about them. But really failure is not a bad thing, you know, I, and I do think it's, it's really good exercise to sort of almost seek out failure, you know, just go for it. Um, what's the worst that can happen? And the final theme I want to come back to is the science. So it's such a privilege to be able to be doing this stuff. And I don't know where my journey will take me next. Um, I really dearly hope to remain in astronomy for the rest of my career. Um, but right now I'm just so um, happy that I am involved and that, I can, um, that I'm able to use telescopes to see light that's 10 billion years old. I just, you know, have to pinch myself when I remember that. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Philippa. Thanks very much for giving such a nice introduction to SKA and also talking about your science and also specifically talking about your career path as well. So I'm sure our 
attendees today would really appreciate this. Thank so, you very um, much. Yeah, thanks again. And since we don't have much time, so I would go straight into the live questions. So, uh, and this question is probably a bit related to the machine learning part that we talked about. And from one of our audiences today, the question is, I'm curious whether the lens systems found by machine learning are new or, or not. If they are new, it shows that machine learning is really powerful. Mm. Okay, yeah, great question. Yes, they are new. Um, there, so various teams, including mine, have looked at this. And obviously one of the, the first things you do is to see if your machine has picked up known lenses, which they seem to be able to do. But yeah, then beyond those known lenses, we're finding lots more as well. Okay, that's great. I have a connected question slightly before we move on. Gail talks about the next one. Um, so how much control do scientists have over the calibration of SKA data? Are we talking about full dependence on computers? Um, yeah, we're talking about um, the mod calibration models that are currently being developed by very large teams at the moment at, at the SKA. Um, so the idea is that you will be presented with images that have calibration errors removed from them already. Um, so at the end result will be hopefully minimal um, efforts needed from science users. Um, I'm sure there will be flexibility, you know, if people want to do some further processing, but I, yeah, I, I can't, I don't want to say for sure um, what the final model will be. Um, but the idea is that we are making very strong models now, very strong calibration algorithms that will mean that um, further interaction you know, in most cases, won't be necessary. Thanks very much. So another live question related uh, to SKA. So I heard that SKA will open its data to the public like Alma. Could you elaborate a bit about this? For example, how long is the proprietary period? And regarding the SKA data, since the data rate is extremely high, is it possible for traditional users to work on the science of SKA without a supercomputer system or super storage system? Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the proprietary nature, I'm not sure. I would have to defer to my operations colleagues who are currently deciding um, on those things. And um, the second part of the question, um, yeah, again, um, we will be presenting, so the, yeah, the idea, sorry, I've slightly forgotten the order of the question, but um, the idea is that science users will be able to interact with um, the regional centres. Um, so um, there will, so in terms of processing, the idea is that regional centres will provide science users with the ability to do their analysis so rather than needing to do the calibration stuff that we all do at the moment, they will actually have more time for doing actual science analysis using those facilities. Thank you. Um, so then if I may, I will uh, go with a question that's on more on your career path. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the secret in keeping a good balance between family and an astrophysics career? How does a regular day of yours look like? Okay, great question. Yeah, that's the golden question, isn't it, for everyone? Um, <laughs> so I think one thing I've learned is how important it is to, to not overwork, actually. So to take breaks and to plan in breaks and to, to ring fence time off to it where you can. It's not always possible. You know, there will be really busy times but as far as possible to ring fence your precious free time, because not only does it keep you healthier, um, but you also, your, your brain works in a different way, obviously at, at those times. And you, you know, you you can be spending your leisure time and suddenly you, you pop up with a solution that you were worrying about in your work time. Um, so I think just being quite regimented really about starting and finishing times is, is something I've, really, really, really appreciated. And it took me a while to understand how important that was. Yeah. That's, that was very nice to get an overview from you as well. 
Thank you. So another question from the live audience, what are the planned milestones of SKA? Okay, um, is this in terms of a roadmap? Um, yes, I, I, I guess so the question does not specify. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, um, we're beginning construction very soon. Um, again, I will, I will refer you to our engineers and construction teams who will answer that. I don't want to say anything too concrete right now, but please do be excited because, you know, <laughs> the IGO is born and everything's ready to go. So maybe we have time for one final question uh, before, because we have five more minutes. Um, so I have one more question from the live audience and um, later on, we will try to answer them um, later on by email and Philippa, if it's okay to you, then we'll send some of the questions your way as well, if that's yes, fine. Yes. Yeah, so uh, then the last question from the live audience is, in your experience of SAFE, which aspects worked for astronomy project management and which didn't? We used it for a period for ASKAP, but found it wasn't great fit for typical astronomy workflows. Uh, okay. I think the key thing about SAFE is making sure everyone's on board. So if you're going to do SAFE, you will have to be fully on board and fully trained in it. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure that's what's happened, but um, I think the, the things that work best from that are uh, the collaboration side of things. So being able to identify who's doing what actually. Um, so when you're, do, when you're in, in SAFE, you have a lot of these tools like JIRA, um, Confluence, and it really um, lends itself very well to transparency and people being able to re reuse each other's work, which I think would go a long way in astronomy. Uh, the difficulties might it's hard to say really. I think it's just, it's quite a steep learning curve when you first start um, and it might not be, for me, for me personally, my personal experience is, um, you know, it's quite, quite overwhelming at first to understand how it all fits together. Um, so, and I think there's also quite a lot of time investment. So it's quite expensive in terms of time actually, um, which people obviously as astronomers, we might feel a little bit of pressure because um, we're we often feel quite time pressured. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. So again, Philippa, thank you again for for joining us, for giving this uh, this nice talk and this nice review of SKA and your your personal career path. Uh, I would like also to thank all the attendees that joined us on on Zoom as well as on uh, on YouTube. And uh, just a quick advertisement uh, for the, um, actually the logo competition. So guys, don't forget to, uh, to vote uh, for the logo for the, um, for the photo competition. Sorry, don't forget to vote for the photo competition as well as for the logo competition that is still going on actually. Uh, you have uh, a few more days left. Uh, for the logo, the voting closes on the 26th. So next, uh, tomorrow. Um, so that's it for the for the competition and for the next event. So the next discourse will be on March 25th. Uh, it will be uh, Dr. Olivier Eno from from ESO. We'll speak about uh, satellite mega constellations and astronomy. So the Phantom Menace or a New Hope. So until then, guys. Um, well, again, Philippa, thank you for for joining. Uh, thanks everyone else for for joining. Uh, and uh, well, stay safe. Um, and uh, take care. Thanks from my side as well. And thanks very much, Philippa, again. And I hope the young people joining today really enjoyed it as well, as much as we did. So thanks everyone and goodbye and stay safe, I suppose, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.